All right, everybody, welcome back to session 4.2 of my FileMaker for Stage Lighting series. I am Mike Wood. At this point, you probably know who I am. I'm going to not do any intro today, and we're going to dive right in. So on my screen right now, I have opened from last time the, uh, the solution we've been building so far in sessions one and two, and then we started last week with adding image capture. I also have open the MBS plugin example files that we dragged over last week. If you haven't done that already, I encourage you to do so. Today, we're gonna to be specifically looking at the ones that are in that graphics magic folder. Um, so we're pretty much done with AV Recorder at this point. We're gonna be looking at graphics magic. And then also over here that might be useful for you today is the kind of the, the, the function reference that MBS puts out because there are, as you see as I scroll through this, hundreds of different functions, well, maybe not hundreds, but a, a whole lot of different functions that are available to us. We're only gonna be using a small, small percentage of them today, but as you start to dive in, you'll start to maybe find other ways that you can use, uh, use all of these other really cool image functions that are available. So I'm gonna minimize that for now. I'm also gonna minimize our solution for now, and we're gonna take a quick second to go over and look at the uh, actual demo files that come with uh, with with MBS. First one I want to look at is the annotate image demo file. And just as a reminder, you want to drag these uh, folders onto your hard drive. Do not run them from the disk image that MBS provides or else you will not be able to edit them. So drag them onto your, on your computer and then we'll get started here. So I'm going to open up the annotate image demo file. And right away you see it looks pretty simple. You've got a, an input image, an output image, and then whatever text you wanna write to it. So I could say, hello, YouTube. And then when I click run, it's written that hello YouTube text on top of the image. Now, right away you might be thinking, okay, Mike, this is great, but why not just create a layout where I've got my focus image or whatever image it is there, and then I just drop text boxes on top of it? And you could absolutely do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, if you're planning on only printing things from FileMaker itself, your focus charts, et cetera, et cetera, that's perfectly fine. You probably could go ahead and skip this entire uh, session and, and really be no better or no worse off for it. Where this comes in handy is being able to export actual image files with all of this various information overlaid on top of it. So that's kind of the purpose of why we're doing this right now. So uh, let's examine this for a second. Let's see what it's doing. Uh, you know, hey, we've got a text field. We've got a script that runs. Uh, if we open up our script editor here, we'll see that there is a couple of different options here. Um, and as I run the different ones, you can, you can watch and see what happens. When I do run transparent, you'll see it does the text with a little transparency. Transparent, transparent with shadow, there's a little bit of shadow to it. That stuff is kind of cool, but not really necessarily what we want for our purposes. So today we're really only gonna be looking at the run script. If we examine this run script a little bit, let's, uh, we see that what it does first is it uh, takes the uh, the input image. In our case, this is going to be our focus photo or whatever focus or whatever photo we have in our existing container, and it kind of like we did with our sessions before, with that same kind of a concept. It's going to start a new graphics magic image session. So it's saying new from container. It's pulling in that that image. Uh, and then we're gonna set a whole bunch of, of, of uh, things that we want to be able to adjust about the text we're gonna annotate. So first you see here, there's a thing that says what font size. In this particular solution, they have made a uh, an input box where you can put in what font size you want. You can definitely do that. We're gonna hard code it in our example, but you can do it either way. Uh, it also says what font path your system font is at. So here, uh, this is Helvetica. Uh, you can do it this way. You can also specify a specific font just by name. Um, so in our example, we're gonna use Arial. Uh, and then fill color. So really these three things, size, uh, what, what font we wanna use, and fill color are the things we, we uh, determine about that text. Then we actually put the text to that image with some, with some dimensions here, which again, we'll go over in a second. Finally, it exports whatever was in that little image session to this other container and then it releases that image. Uh, you know, We talked about the idea of, of releasing a session last week with, with cameras, kind of the same thing. It's releasing that image out of, out of the MBS memory or out of the MBS process there. So it's really a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple script when everything is all said and done. We're gonna make it a little bit more complicated as we always do, but this is the basics of what, we, of what we're doing here. 
The other demo file that we want to look at today is the combine pictures file. So the combine pictures file allows us to do a whole bunch of things. Uh, again, way more than we're ever going to do. But at the, the very uh, base level, it's got a base image and then another image and then it puts that image on top of the other one. So we're gonna get into this a little bit later today, but this is how we could add a show logo or any other graphic that you might want on top. And of course, there's all kinds of different things you can, uh, you know, based on how it's compositing these images together, we could divide colors, we could do all kinds of stuff with it. So this is all very, very powerful. So we'll get back to that in a second. So for now, let's go ahead and go over at, go back to our solution. I'm gonna leave the demo file open. I'm just gonna minimize it for now, just so we have this script reference available to us in case we need it. Uh, and I'm going to open up our, our, our existing, um, our existing solution that we've been building so far. Now, the first thing I wanna do, you know, we, so far when we were doing our image capture, we did those things over on our focus assistant tab. And then of course it was over here under photos. That's a lot of clicking. So for the purposes of today, I'm gonna to add a new layout that is strictly for capturing photos. And of course to do that, I'm gonna do command shift L to open up my layout manager or go to file manage layouts. And then because I've already, again, got a style here, got something I like, all I'm gonna do is duplicate the focus assistant layout that I've already made. And I'm gonna rename that to, photo, or let's say uh, instrument photo capture. Great, I'm gonna open it. And then of course, close the other one so I know what I'm editing. And then I'm gonna go into layout editor, command L, and I'm gonna just basically, <laughs> Uh, all I really care about is this capture photo button and this focus photo. So I'm gonna move them off out of the layout for now. I'm gonna delete this entire tabbed object and then just bring these back in. And now what, it, what that's done for me is it's created a, it's created a layout that is essentially just for capturing photos. And you see there's the one from last week that we captured um, right there. Okay. Uh, so then the other thing we need to do is we need to add a new container field that is going to uh, uh, hold the annotated image that we make. Now you could overwrite the one you the one you already have. It's totally up to you if you want to do that. For now, I would recommend making a separate container just to keep it a little bit simpler and to help it make a little bit more sense as we're going through. So I'm going to open up my database manager, command shift D. And under instruments here, you see I already have a focus photo container field. If you click on it, it makes it a little bit faster because you don't have to type as much. I'm gonna make a field called focus photo annotated, make sure it's a container, and that's really all there is to it. I'm gonna click okay. And then all I have to do is, I'm gonna option click and drag this over and link this field over to the uh, annotated photo uh, container. So now I've got a focus photo, I've got an annotated photo, and, uh, and I'm ready to get working. Now, before we dive into the scripts, let's start thinking a little bit about what information we might want on top of this photo. Uh, we probably want the channel number, we might want the position, the unit number, maybe the purpose. Uh, really, you decide, uh, but for that, I think that's all we're gonna do for today. So I'm gonna just drag those fields in so that I see them. I've got channel number, I've got position, got unit number and purpose. This also helps me with navigation a little bit. So as I'm, if I go back to browse mode here, and as I click through this now, you can see I've got all that information there. It also just kind of helps me as I start to lay out these scripts, remember exactly what I want to put where. Okay, so now we have uh, our original container. We have a new container. We have the information that we want here. Let's go ahead and start building some scripts. So I'm gonna close this just to get it off my screen, open up my script editor here. And as you might imagine, I'm gonna create a new folder down here under AV Capture, and I'm going to call this annotation. And I'm gonna make a new script that is annotate focus image. 
Of course, as we get into this, and I don't know where this series is going to go, but if we do start adding more image capture one day, we'll explore how to make one script that does multiple things. For now, we're just going to focus on just uh, uh, focus photo annotation because that's going to be a little bit simpler. So of course, right away, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping, set error capture on. We're going to do allow user abort on. And we're going to freeze the window. Great. So the first thing I want to do is I want to define a variable that is going to be the text that is actually written into my image. So in the demo file, there was a there was actually a field that that happened in where you could type whatever you want in. For our purposes, it's probably always going to be the same thing. So I'm going to do set variable, and then I'm going to define that variable, and we'll call it. Let's just call it text. And then we're going to calculate this. The calculation is going to be. What about channel with a colon and a space? There's our text. And then we're going to add or concatenate the channel number to that. Channel number and instruments channel. And then maybe there's another little bit of text. So there's and maybe a dash and maybe the purpose. Great. So that's going to basically say, you know, channel four. Space, space, slash, uh, dash, space, and then the purpose after it. Do whatever you want there, but you get the idea. Great. So I've got that defined. Next thing I want to do then is start looking at that demo, uh, that demo script here where I, oh, I have all of these steps. Now I'm going to retype them just so I'm not copy pasting them just to kind of get them into, into your memory a little bit better. But really we're going to be recreating lines five through 14 here. So I'm going to leave this behind just as a little uh, reference for us. Um, and of course it's good to comment these things so you know what you're doing later. So you can, you can add comment lines by doing a, a hashtag slash pound sign. I can say set the annotation text. Now I'll do another one. Let's maybe initial initiate session. And this is going to be set var oops. Set variable. And if we look back at our demo file for a second, the MBS solutions use the variable ref for reference. So that's the image reference. And that's what I'm going to use here just for uh, for simplicity's sake. And then the value for that is going to be an MBS function. Our function name is, oops, our function name is gm image dot new from container. And if you look at the reference, there's different things you can do new from file, you can do new from container. Since we're getting our image from an existing container, that's why we're using get from uh, new from container. And then a semicolon, and then what container we're getting the image from. So of course that's coming from Focus Photo. So this is what it should look like. We're calling GM Image New from Container with a with the uh, instruments Focus Photo as our our parameter. I guess you could call it there. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is set the uh, font details. First thing we want to do is set another variable. And again, we're going to use the R variable for this, because remember, this is how we tell MBS that we want to change something. Uh, MBS has started an image session with this last command. So now we are telling MBS what we want to do with that session. And we're going to say MBS, the function name in this case is GM image. And I'm going to I'm going to copy this part to the clipboard since we're using this a whole lot. GM image dot set font point size. And then of course, after that semicolon, it wants two different parameters. Now the first one is going to be what what image what session we're talking about. So that's going to be ref as we defined in the last step. And then after that, it's going to add, it wants to know what our font size is. So I'm going to say eh, maybe 40 for now, 40 points, just like that. So I've set my uh, size. Next thing I want to do is set the actual font. And you could do these in opposite order if you want. This is just the way I make sense in my mind. Uh, GM image set font. And then I'm going to say Arial black. 
it's a good one because it's on pretty much any system. Point size, set font. And then finally, we're going to do a fill color. Set fill color to ref. And then we're going to be doing, we want RGB and 111. Now, let's look at the function reference here for a second so we can get an idea of what values it's wanting there. So this was image set fill color. So I'm going to go all the way down here. Where is it? Oh, alphabetical, duh, Mike. Set fill color. Great. So this basically, when you open up this reference, it gives you details of, of what you want it to be. So if you say RGB, then it's going to ask, for, well, I guess it does RGBA. Interesting. Um, and it gives you some samples down here as well. So read through this. You can get ideas of how to do different things. For our particular case, and you can also do it with hex. So if you want to do uh, if you want to do a hex value, you can do that. Lots of different options there. For me, RGB 111 is going to give us white text. Next step up, let's add another comment. We're going to say write text to image. Set variable. And again, this is going to be an R variable to give MBS instructions. And the value for this is going to be MBS. Our function is, whoops. I guess I can't paste. Interesting. GM image dot annotate. And now it wants a couple of different things here. It wants the, uh, the session. So we're going to do ref again semicolon, then it wants to know what text you're annotating, which of course we defined earlier as text, local variable text. And then finally, it wants dimensions for that. For that. So for right now, I'm going to type in, well, let's go look at the function reference for, for a second so you can see exactly what we are, what these numbers mean. So it was GM image annotate. Um, so it wants, basically, it's a bounding area. So it is uh, width and height and then an optional offset. So basically what this is, is going to say how wide and how tall it is um, offset by however many pixels. What is it? Uh, I think it's high by wide. We'll experiment a little bit. Oh, yeah, width and height. So width, uh, how far off from the upper left-hand corner and how far down from the upper left-hand corner. You can also do specific gravities to the image itself. So I could say something like uh, center gravity, which would put it direct center. We're going to experiment with this in a little bit as well. But for this first one, we're going to use this bounding area instead. So for mine, I am going to do 100 by 200 plus 20 plus 60, again, all in quotes. And then what is, and then it wants at the end of that, oh, yeah, it does want the gravity after that. So one more after that, I'm going to say one. One being for uh, the origin point being in the very top left corner. A question just came in for for choosing font size. Is the name as the same as it is in any drop down text option? It should be. Um, I've only experimented with this on Mac. Uh, can't speak to PC, but uh, when you when you're using the actual font name, uh, it should be whatever the font name is on your system. So whatever drops down there. If that doesn't work for some reason, uh, go back to the demo file and you could define a path to the font file directly on your computer instead. Um, you might have better results with that. I think it really depends on what system you're running. Okay, great. So now we've written the text of the image. But this image is still kind of hovering out in, in the ether. It's still in MBS somewhere. We haven't actually put this in a container yet. So the next thing we want to do is put image in container. And so that's going to be a set field command or script step, excuse me. And this time we're going to target the annotated field with a calculated result of MBS GM image dot write 
to ping container. Now you can, if you go to the re uh, function reference, you can see you can actually write to several different kinds of image format. I'm going to use ping. You could do JPEG. I think you can do GIF, and I think you can do TIFF as well. Um, I'm just doing them as pings for today. Uh, and then, of course, what what image are we doing? We're doing the ref image that we've set up earlier, just like that. And if we compare this back over to our demo script, the only thing we have missing is releasing that image uh, back away out of out of the memory here. So let's say release. This will be set variable. Now, for some reason in the demo file, it uses the variable of error. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. Somebody who's a uh, who is an actual file maker or MBS developer could probably tell you why that is. I think. In my, in my guess, it doesn't actually matter what you name this because all that really matters is that you're calling the MBS function. Um, so I'm just going to follow along with what they did here. And that is gm image, oops, gm image free. And then, of course, I'm going to tell it to free up or to release ref. A big thing to remember as you're watching these videos is I am, I have figured this out as I go along. And so if anybody is watching this who is a professional file maker developer or somebody from MBS and is like, wait, this is the this is dumb. You should do it this way. Please feel free to reach out because uh, all of this is self-taught. Um, so I'm sure there are much better ways to do a lot of the things that I'm doing. And I encourage you to experiment and find those those ways uh, and then let me know so I can I can update and, and learn myself. OK, so this is our basic script. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click play and fingers crossed that it works. Let's see what happens here. Run. Look at that. It did. I've got channel 288 pipe and blue and I should probably zoom in a little bit on this layout so you could see this a little bit better on your tiny YouTube screens. But right there, it did exactly what I asked it to. It put channel 288, pipe in blue. And now once I have that initial text on here, here we could start playing around with some of these other dimensions a little bit. So what if I made this uh, 100 or 100 here, for example, and I play it again. That offset it in a little bit more. So yeah, so this is the, the, the text area that you're making. And then 100 is off. This is offset from uh, left, right. And this is offset up, down. I kind of liked it where it was, honestly, over at 20 and 60 down. So I run it again. There we go, pipe and blue. Now, a couple of quick things that we notice. OK, well, that's great. Maybe I want to play around with having multiple lines. Maybe I want to put like a copyright text at the bottom. Maybe I want to add a show logo, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are definitely possible. Um, the other thing I noticed right away is, OK, this white text here looks good on this particular picture. But what happens if I've got a picture that's uh, mostly a lighter color up here? Um, do I want to do I want to maybe put a fill color behind that text? Do I want the text to be the color to be dynamic based on the on the image? For me, I like to just put a, a fill box behind it so all of my images look the same. I would never want to have uh, I would never want to have the I would never want to have a different color text for all my different annotated images. So what we're going to look at today is, is adding that fill behind it and also doing multiple lines. So let's look at doing multiple lines first. <laughs> So I'm going to go back to this exact same script that I had. I'm not going to make this a separate script. I'm just going to keep adding to it because now that I know that I have the base, uh, I can I can I can keep building on it from there. So now instead of uh, having a variable of text, maybe I say the first variable is line one, and maybe that first line is only the channel number, and then maybe I have line two. And then maybe line two is the purpose. Simple as that. So now what I can do, and I'm hitting Command S to save this as I go through, um, just FYI. So now what I can do is I can go through and I can write these things. <clears throat> and instead of this being annotate, uh, or instead of this being text, this could be line one. And now I could just duplicate that and make it line two. And of course, if we save that and run it as is, it's going to give us uh, those two text boxes right over top of each other. So I can come in here and I could offset this a little bit. So uh, let's say it's 60. Maybe we make it 
100. Offsetting that second one. Boom, and now I've got a double line thing. You might also be able to do this with, uh, you know, you could put carriage returns in your in your single line and then make your, your text box size. You could do all that kind of stuff. My mind just works better if you have specific information on specific lines and you know it's always gonna be that way. I have not experimented with doing carriage returns, but I would think there'd be no reason why it wouldn't work. We could even do a third line if we wanted to. line three, and we could say maybe this is position, and then, oops, unit, so it's saying position and space U, and then the unit number. And we can do the same thing here, just basically rewrite this again. So maybe this is 140. Of course, we want to make that line three. Now when I run it, there we go, eight electric U2. So that's great. I'm gonna delete that third line for now just because I'm just really care about, the, care about those first two on this particular example, but you get the idea where you can put pretty much any information you want onto that image. The next thing I wanna look at doing is starting to add uh, maybe things to the bottom here. Maybe I want the show name, maybe I want a copyright text of some kind. So for this, we're going to play around, actually I'm gonna make this text a little bit bigger too, I think, maybe instead of 40, let's make this a 60 point at the top just so it's nice and, nice and readable. Of course, when I did that, they, they overlapped a little bit. So maybe add maybe 10 more points to this offset. The cool thing about these offsets too is you could get way more complicated than this if you wanted to. You could have calculations that determine this offset based on an input field of your text size. For my purposes, I'm just hard coding at all, but you really could get pretty creative with, um, with, your, uh, with your calculations here. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I want to put in a couple of things at the bottom. Let's say I want these things to always be the same. So let's uh, copyright text, for example, or maybe not copyright, maybe a maybe a like internal use only text at the bottom or something like that. Oops. So that's going to be again, we're going to tell MBS by uh, using the local variable of R. And Actually, rather than writing this from scratch, I might as well just copy paste one of these lines, huh? But instead of now, instead of referencing line two, I'm gonna delete the rest of this. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give it some hard text. I'm gonna say for internal use only. And then uh, maybe I don't wanna give it a specific uh, size, but I do wanna say specifically where it is. So I'm gonna say, hmm, how about south gravity? So now when I run this, I've got for internal use only written across the bottom. Of course, south gravity is gonna be the very bottom center. And if you go back to that image reference of, uh, or excuse me, of the to the function reference, you'll see all of those different gravities that are available. They can also be expressed as numbers. So in the, in the first example here, we used one for northwest. Uh, here I typed out south. Um, you know, do whatever works for you, but I just wanna show you multiple ways of doing it. Now you might be noticing right away, okay, this is cool, but like I don't want a giant for internal use only text at the bottom. Can I change the text size of that particular box only? And the answer of course is yes. Uh, this, the script, the MBS is gonna work basically in the order that you specify things. So once these first two lines are written to the image, now I could go ahead and rechange my font size, maybe down to let's say a, maybe a 35. And anything after that is gonna be 35. So when I click play again, now you see this top stated a 60, but the bottom got smaller. So maybe I do that there. Maybe here I do, um, I say Mike Wood Lighting. Maybe this is Southwest. And then maybe I do one more at the bottom left that is the date or something like that. And of course you could have that be dynamic. You could also do, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm saying uh, a lot today. I apologize for that. 
You could also do your show name. If you've set that up somewhere in admin settings, if you've got it as a global variable, all kinds of different options there. Now, when I click play, you see I've got Mike Wood Lighting for internal use only 2021. And no matter what size the image is, we know because we're using these gravities that they are going to be anchored to the bottom or to wherever you necessarily put those things. Pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so the next thing we wanna look at is compositing two images together. So far, we've got all the text on here. Eventually, we're gonna add some background to that text, but the next thing I wanna look at is adding maybe the show logo over here in the top right-hand corner. To do that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to use, uh, basically what I'm gonna be doing is creating two separate uh, uh, sessions here with G the GM, uh, the Graphics Magic Image plug. Uh, excuse me, I'm losing my train of thought. We're going to create two separate sessions. We've got our one, our reference session here, which is our main image. Then we're going to create another session that pulls a logo file into memory and then eventually composites that on top of our existing photo. So to do that here, I'm going to say set variable. And instead of ref, I'm going to call this logo. Still using this new image, but instead of from container this time, I'm going to use the new image from file function. And then of course, after that, it's going to want a path to wherever that file is on my computer. Now, if you have been, gotten a little bit deeper into this and you've done something like setting up a, you know, show information on your admin page and you have a container for your show logo, you could use the new from container there. That's perfectly fine. And then of course reference that, but I'm gonna show you how to do it from a file. So for now, I'm just gonna click okay. If I open up Finder again, I've got, let's see here, on my desktop, if you remember correctly, I made a folder in an earlier sessions called review. And if we go back to our admin layout, you see we set up a export folder path here. And for me, that was on my desktop slash review. So I'm gonna use that same folder just for the heck of it. It's for simplicity's sake, really. And you can see in that folder, I have a file called logo.jpg. And this was a logo from a production of Footloose that I was supposed to do last year. RIP. So I've got this right here, logo.jpg. And of course on a Mac, if you hold down option, if you right click and then hold down option, you can copy it as a path name. Um, you can copy the whole path to it. That's great. You can do that if you want. I'm gonna type the whole thing out just for, for clarity's sake here. So inside of these two little uh, quotation marks here, I'm gonna do the full path to that image file. So for me, that's users, Mike Wood, desktop, review logo.jpg. So now what it's doing is it's pulling, it's creating a new session here in addition to the existing one saying logo uh, pull uh, for uh, under the variable of logo and it's pulling in that file that I have in that directory. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is let's with somewhere here between text and putting the image in the container, I want to do a composite image. And first thing I want to do is scale it so I know it's going to be the right size. And as you imagine, there's an MBS function for that. And it is gm.image scale. GM image gm image dot scale. And then of course it wants to know what image. And it was logo. And I guess in no, you couldn't, you couldn't specify the path there because you have to pull it. You have to start a new image session before you do it. So you do have to define that variable first. And then of course it wants the, the crop or excuse me, the scale that you want it at. So I'm going to say maybe 200 by 200 like that. And then it's as simple as saying, instead of scale, my next function is going to be gm.composite. First thing it's going to ask me is what the base image is. So that base image was ref. Then the overlay image is logo. And then the next thing it wants is the gravity. So I'm going to choose three for upper right hand corner. And then finally, 
the composite type, which is one. And if you remember back to that demo file, there's all there was like 20 some different kinds. You can go to the go to the function reference and see what they all different do what they all do. But one is essentially just dropping an uh, number one is essentially just dropping one image on top of the other one. Image composite. Great. And then of course, just like I released ref here, I want to release the logo session after I'm done. Save. Now when I run it, there we go. Now I've got a nice little show logo up here in the top corner. Uh, and again, this is all embedded on this image. It's actually made an image file. It's not just dropping text boxes on top. Okay. So the only two things left to do today then are going to be to go ahead and create some background rectangles to go behind these things to, uh, to make them easier to read and then export them to our hard drive. So let's start with, with those rectangles. Now, like I mentioned before, as you're going through the script, MBS is gonna do the things in the order that you specify. So it's gonna write this text, then it's gonna write this text, then you know, it changes the font size, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to make sure that I am defining any kind of rectangles or anything before I do the text. If I do them after the text, it's gonna drop them on top of my text boxes and on top of my logo. So here before I get to, even before I get to the font details, I'm gonna put it here. Make some white space for me. Uh, background fill. And I'm going to, uh, just like I do with my text, the first thing I want to do is specify a couple of options about that rectangle. So I'm going to specify fill color here. And instead of 111, one, I'm going to make them black, which is 0, 0, 0. Uh, next thing is going to be to draw draw a rectangle, Oops. I'm not clicking in the right place. Okay, um, R, yes, function for this is going to be gm image dot draw rectangle. And then it wants a couple of things. Of course, it's going to want to know where we're drawing it. It's going to be on ref. And then it wants a couple of different measurements. So for right now, let's go back over to our function reference again. And let's look at it. So we're looking for the GM image draw rectangle function. So the parameters it wants, the image reference number, upper left position, or excuse me, upper upper left X position, upper left Y position, lower right X, lower right Y. So basically what we're doing is we're specifying the four corners of that particular box. So for me, I'm gonna say it's gonna start in the top corner. And then maybe let's say five, maybe 300 pixels wide and maybe 120 pixels tall, eh, maybe 100 pixels tall. And I'm just going to try that and see what happens. Great. I'm back over here to my demo. Let's click play. Forgot to save it. What am I missing here? Draw, draw rectangle. Stand by. Oh, I forgot to put a semicolon between reference and zero. That's what it was. A question just came in. Could you expand the size of your output image, putting your putting your objects outside the original picture area? Uh, I believe you can. Um, uh, you'd have to go through. You'd have to go through the demo files. I, but I am almost paused. I know there are ones that do different sizing things of the photos. So the answer to that, Lee, is yes. I just don't know off the top of my head how to do it. But that's a really good point. Okay, so I missed a semicolon before, so let's try this again, running it. Mm, that didn't work, what did I do wrong? Oh wait, it did work. You can see it there, it's just tiny. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. If I zoom way far in, there's a little box there, it's just very small. So what if I did something like set my size to be 3000 pixels wide? 
and I run it. There we go. Now we've got a pretty decent sized box. And because even though it's 3000 pixels wide, it's not, it has not expanded my image at all. But you might be thinking, oh, we could probably make that a little bit smarter, couldn't we? Couldn't we make it so it knows exactly how wide whatever image it is and then, you know, pass that along in there? And absolutely we can. And the other thing I noticed right away here is that the bot, it's not quite big enough to fill in my entire text. So maybe instead of 100, I make it something like 120. And now when I run it, there we go. Now I fit my entire thing in there. Um, that works pretty well, but let's go ahead and make this a little bit smarter. So I want, instead of 3000 or some arbitrary number of pixels, I want this to be exactly as wide as my image is. So in order to do that, I'm going to go all the way up here to the top of my script and I'm going to define a new variable. There's a whole lot of variables in this script, isn't there? And I'm going to call this variable width. And the value is going to be, this is a just a built-in FileMaker function, get width of the image uh, focus photo field. So it's going to basically return the width of whatever media is in my original field. And then as you probably guessed, instead of 3000 here, I'm going to say, I should have spaced these out just to make it easier to read. Sorry about that. Instead of 3000, I'm going to say width. And now when I run it, you're not going to really notice a difference here because again like it's it's the we made a box that was the you know already bigger than the photo but it makes it just a little bit uh, cleaner and while we're at it we might as well add a height variable there too we might use it later on and you might have guessed it's get height so now when our script runs it's just getting the width and the height of that and then we can use those variables later on lovely Check it one more time, make sure we didn't mess anything up. That works. Okay, so now let's look at adding a rectangle to the bottom. If we look at, you know, again, back to the function reference, it wants all of this stuff based on uh, x, y coordinates within our image itself. So it gets a little bit harder to draw a rectangle to the bottom of it uh, the way we do with our text. So with our text box, we're able to define a specific gravity or specific offsets. With this, we need hard x, y coordinates for, um, for where that box is gonna go. But it is pretty simple uh, as far as implementing. So all I need to do is just copy paste this variable again, because I wanna use the same fill color. And now instead of uh, zero, zero, whatever, I'm going to say in this, uh, I think this was, what was this, the Y, I'm going to say the height minus maybe 40 pixels. Still want it to be however wide it is. And then I want that offset down by the height. So again, let me, before I close that, let me explain it one more time here just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, ah, where'd it go? So I've got upper x uh, upper left x position which is zero so it's not it's not moving anywhere off of oh that's way too big uh it's not it's not moving anywhere off of the side of my image the next one it wants is the the y for the the starting position so it's going to be the total height minus 40 pixels so that sets our start point and then it wants the lower position which is going to be all the way across our image the width and the lower y position is our height because that's going to def that that the height of the image is the is the bottom of the image essentially. So height minus forty, width height. Now this could also be height minus a variable of whatever your text font size is. Um, you can get creative there with that if you want. Okay, so let's save that. I don't need you anymore. Now when I run it. There we go. Now I've got a black bar across the bottom here, and we made what was our font size at the bot uh, on that? We made it like a 35, right? So maybe I could say instead of 40, maybe it's 36. Save it. Run it again. There we go. That's a little bit smaller. 
Great. Now you might, this, this black bar solution might work for you. It might not work for you. You could also get creative with transparency on these things. Again, if you go back to the demo files, you can look at them and you can see there's all kinds of stuff you can do with transparency. I'm going to keep it simple for today, but I encourage you to go and experiment with that a little bit and see how you could use that to your advantage. I might want to make these like 50% transparent just so I can read my text, but that it, so that it doesn't, um, doesn't interfere with the photo behind. The other thing that you can play around with with the text annotation is uh, rotation. So there's a rotation parameter you can set in there. So maybe you wanted to put, you know, draft across it like Lightwrite does. You could definitely do that. Again, look back at the, the example files and the, the, the function reference to figure out how to do all of that. So the last thing I want to show you today is the how to get this image out of FileMaker and onto your computer. Of course, you can right click on the container and you can say export field contents, but as you would probably imagine, it's pretty simple to automate that and to do it as you're capturing the photo. Actually, we should go ahead and add a little button before we do that. Maybe we have a capture photo button and we have an annotate photo button here. Get a little pencil icon. Yeah, maybe that. Okay. So now uh, let me clear this out of here. So now when I click this button, it's going to run the script and it's going to do it for me just like that. How fun. Okay. So let's go ahead and make us make ourselves a script that exports this image for us. So over here in my script editor under the annotation, I'm going to make a new script that is export image. And as usual, I'm going to do some uh, housekeeping at the top. And the first thing I want to do is if, if this is going back to a long time ago, we talked about, you know, we made on our admin layout here, oops, on our admin layout, we made this export path for our PDFs. So you could click a button and it would automatically export those files to PDF for you. For the purposes of today, I'm gonna to use this exact same, uh, this field, this exact same path. Now, in order to get this uh, to a place where it's available to us um, throughout our entire file without defining some more relationships, we can actually make sure that every time we open this file up, this file path is set as a global variable. So if you go to Tools, uh, Data Viewer, you can see that so far the only thing we have set uh, as far as global variables is our system platform. For me, it's a one because I'm running on a Mac. Yours might be different. And if you remember, we set that using the startup script right here, where as soon as you started the file or opened your file, it set that variable as whatever number the get system platform uh, result was for your particular thing. And then it used that global variable to determine which layout to go to. Now, as our, file, as our solution has advanced a little bit more, maybe we could edit this a little bit so we're not necessarily going to the work notes anymore. Maybe instead, we're going just to that admin layout. Maybe, we, maybe later on, we want to add some buttons on that admin layout that can navigate us to different places. And really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave that up here at the top, and I'm just gonna do leave it here. So if, if three, which I believe was FileMaker Go when we did our mobile solution, then it would go to the iPhone work notes. You could also make an iPhone admin page if you wanted to. But, um, but anyway, so this is going to allow us to go ahead and set that this field as a global variable where we can use it anywhere. So I'm moving that, that, that go to layout step to the top here. So whenever I open my file, it's always going to go to the admin layout. It's going to set system platform, and then it's going to set excuse me, it's going to set the variable of, what's well, my spot? It's gonna set a variable of export path to the field. And that field is of course, export folder path. So I'm gonna save that and when I run it, you can see now the contents of that field have been pulled into here. And again, this is because so far in our solution, we have not set up any kind of relationship between that admin table and other things. For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna leave it that way for now. And we'll just use a global variable for it. Okay, so it's important though that we go to that, that, that layout first because without a relationship, if we're on a different layout, it's not gonna be able to pull in the, the that, that into the global. So we're gonna to go to admin, 
we're going to set our two globals and then we can leave this here at the bottom that goes to the iPhone work notes layout if we happen to be on an iPhone. Okay, so we've got that defined for us. Now let's go ahead and get back over to our export script. So the first thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna set up that, uh, I'm gonna set up my file name for the, the actual exported image. So for me, this is three variables. You could do it in one, but to make it a little bit easier to read, I'm gonna do it as three separate steps. So the first one is going to be folder path, and it's gonna be as simple as just saying export path. And of course that's duplicating data for now, but again, just to, to show you how this works, then you can combine it later if you want. Next we're gonna uh, do a file name. And this, uh, at the very least, is going to be, let's say we want all of our, our image files to be named channel and then their channel number. So I'm gonna say channel space and then instruments channel number. And then of course, I need an extension and dot, and what were we, we're using ping for this. So I'm gonna say dot ping. If you were using a JPEG uh, thing in MBS instead, you would use JPEG there. Okay. And then finally, we'll concatenate those two things together as file path. And that, of course, will be folder path and file name. Okay. So before we do this, we should check a couple of things, uh, mainly where our forward slashes are. So with our data viewer open here, we see that our export path does not have a trailing forward slash on it. We also did not define one here in our file name. So essentially what that's going to do is it's going to create an export path that is review and then right after the W is gonna be the letter C for Chan. So we want to either make sure that we're adding that slash here or that we're adding that slash here, or I guess we could add it between if you wanted to as well. For me, I'm going to add it right there in front of Chan, just like that, okay? And then the last step is to export field contents. Target field is going to be on our instruments table, our annotated, and the file is going to be this file path variable that we just set up. I'm gonna leave create folders off for now. Okay, and then we'll go back over here. Let's go back to our photo capture. I'm gonna open up this folder in the background here so we can see it. And let's just, I've got four screens here and I can only show you one at a time. So I'm trying to make best use of my, my real estate here. Let me, let me make a little more room for myself. Okay, so there's my review folder, here's this. Let's click play and see what happens. There we go, channel 288.ping, and it exported that annotated image. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's pretty cool, but I'm already using this review folder to hold all my paperwork. So can I have it automatically go into a folder? Of course you can. So maybe instead of uh, here in our file name, instead of it being a slash Chan, maybe I add another, maybe I say annotated, or maybe I say images slash annotated, maybe I wanna export both of them. And now when I run this, watch what happens. Nothing happens, and why is that? Nothing happens because I didn't already have those folders set up on my system. This is where this create folders option in the export field contents uh, comes into handy. So if I turn that on and I run it again, now you see it's made an image folder, it's made an annotated folder, and it's got a channel folder, which is pretty cool and delete that for a second. I could get even more complicated or uh, fine-tuned with that if I wanted to. And maybe instead of images annotated, I could say images slash, and then maybe I add, um, maybe I make a folder that is just the purpose there, right? Maybe I say purpose. Or I guess a better one would be position, right? What I miss? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, I gotta move. 
get rid of that. So images and doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah, that's right. So now when I do it and I click play, images number eight electric. And if I went through and did all of these, then it would give me folders for every single electric, um, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty, pretty powerful stuff. And of course you could do this multiple ways. You could have it export to multiple folders if you want to. You can get really creative with how you set up these folder paths um, and how you label your files as well. Great. Okay. So then let's, uh, to, to finish off the day, and I think we'll make this an even hour long, uh, to finish off this day, let's go ahead and automate everything that we've done so far. So right now we have three separate scripts, one that will capture our photo, one that will annotate our photo, and one that will export that photo. And then delete all this stuff that we've made so far. Oops. Let's combine those things together. Uh, maybe we do that in the capture photo script. Yeah, let's just do it here. Now, if you wanted to, you could take these two things, you could copy paste all of the steps from these and throw them into this script. That's a valid way to do that if you know that every single time you're gonna wanna do it. You of course could also, um, you could also put dialog boxes there where it would ask you, hey, do you want to annotate this image? Do you wanna export this image? Absolutely valid, you could absolutely do that. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna do, I think something we haven't done yet, and that's going to be to call a script within another script. So I'm gonna say execute uh, no, script, a perform script, that's what it is. I'm gonna say perform script, and I'm gonna choose annotate focus image. And then I'm going to do it again, and I'm going to say capture photo or uh, export photo. Great. So now let me kill my camera here for a second. If I come back over here and I click this capture photo button, of course it's going to ask me if I want to start a new session. We coded that in last week. I'm going to say let's do it from my cam link and start a preview. Here I am. Right there. Close this. Now, when I capture that photo, it annotated it, and look at that. It dropped it right into my uh, folder for me. There I am, my wonderful limelight wired hat. Um, so yeah, so it's as simple as that, and it's really up to you how much of that you want to automate and how much you want to keep separate. Of course, if I wanted to if I had all my images already captured, I could create a script that loops through and exports every single one of those images. Um, I could export multiple. Uh, maybe we could we could look at that real quick if we wanted to. Um, I could do, let's see, I've got this. Focus photo, maybe we export the original as well. And let's see, file path A for annotated. Path A, and maybe this is file path B. Something like that. I probably shouldn't be doing this live. Oh, it worked. There we go. Now I've got here's the next port. B. Ah, here we go. Set this to B. And when I run this, there's the clean image. Here's the annotated image. So you could get really creative with it if you wanted to. Um, I'm going to stop ad libbing before I mess something up, but you get the idea. And yeah, I think that's actually it for today. So next week, we will be looking at how to take all of this and auto automate the image capture and EOS at the same time. So we're going to look at turning a light on, snapping the photo, annotating the photo, and then exporting that photo, and then turning that light off, moving on to the next light, and going all the way through a rig or all the way through a position. So that'll be super handy, super helpful. What I found with this is that it will allow you to knock out your entire focus photo documentation and, you know, depending on how long your or how big your rig is, you could knock it out in under an hour. And instead of having to sit there and click through every single one, turn the light on, you can have it all be automatic, which is really cool. Um, a couple questions had come in over the week about 
how to do this if you have multiple image fields? And the answer to that is as simple as kind of what I just did where I'm exporting these multiple fields. You, you do it just like that. Uh, when you're doing in this annotation script, you could have a have a script parameter or you could have a dialog box that asks you in the beginning which one of the fields you want to be working in. So let's say you have an, uh, a focus image, you have an onstage image, you have a detail image. You click a button and you could still have this same script, but it will it will export to a specific container or pull in from a specific container based on a script parameter or based on something you that you defined earlier on. So really powerful stuff there. But that is it for today. We are almost exactly at an hour, which is really cool. I try to keep these to an hour. So far, I've done an okay job of it. Um, if there's any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll hang out for a couple more minutes. Otherwise, I will see you all next week for the final session in this chapter, which is that EOS integration. Thanks, everybody.